Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Museum of American Finance. Hi, I'm David Cowan, president of the museum, and today we're joined by Michael Van Bema. He is the founder and managing principal of Van Bema Value Partners, which he established in 2004. Now, Michael knows a lot about value investing, so much so that he taught a class at Columbia Business School on the subject. He is a frequent speaker at conferences, the author of numerous publications, including one uh, that was published in the Harvard Business Review, and he's co-author of a previous book, uh, Value Investing from Graham to Buffett and Beyond. His bachelor's degree was in electrical engineering from Princeton University, and his graduate work, his PhD, was in computer science at Columbia University. Now in this new book, he and his co-authors have interviewed and analyzed the success of some of the most famous value investors, certainly household names that you have heard of like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and then a few others you probably have not heard of that he's going to discuss today. So let's now concentrate on concentrated investing, which will be on sale after, and Michael will be happy to autograph a copy if you so choose to buy one. Michael. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Okay, yes. And uh, I want to thank the Museum of Finance for sponsoring the uh, talk today. And I also want to uh, mention my two co-authors, Alan Bonello and Toby Carlisle, who of course were uh, integral to the creation of the book. Um, <clears throat> so uh, how do you pick great stocks? That's actually not what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> People love talking about how one picks stocks and which stocks may or may not be great at the moment. But what <clears throat> I want to talk about and what really inspired the book is uh, <clears throat> a uh, phenomena that uh, all three of the co-authors noticed, which is that there are some very smart managers out there. In fact, there are lots of very smart managers out there but only some of them produce spectacular returns over the long term. And the question came to us is, how do you sort of understand which managers are producing the fantastic uh, outperformance results and which manager, even though they may have the same or greater IQ, are actually not able to produce those sorts of long-term results, and uh, we called this the uh, X factor when we were starting to investigate the uh, subject for the book, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we think the X factor is and how it comes to play and how it can, in fact, enable you or <clears throat> other investors who you know to create long-term returns by both <clears throat> increasing the uh, size of your winning positions and hopefully drastically reducing the size of your uh, less successful positions. So <clears throat> Warren Buffett, of course, is famous for saying that uh, if you have a very high IQ, you really don't need it for the money management business. You can sell some of your IQ points to somebody else and invest the money better elsewhere. And uh, you know, that's uh, as with most things that Buffett says, we found there to be a great deal of truth to that. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, real central core of the book, although there are certainly other aspects to it, is that we found that many of the great investors who we really admire and who have had great 20, 30 year plus track records ran in fact surprisingly concentrated portfolios and hence, hence obviously the title of the book. Um, and uh, the other th thing, which is also tremendously important, is they had very, very expanded time horizons. So, you know, typical Wall Street trader extended, extended time horizon is probably two days. Typical Wall Street investor expanded time horizon is probably two quarters. And uh, most good money managers the extended time horizon is two or three years. But <clears throat> the guys who we profile in the book 
actually thought in periods of seven to ten years, which is a phenomenally different period of time. So <clears throat> those two factors, in fact, uh, are what we feel is or found were main contributors to their outstanding performance, along with certain personality traits. And uh, I'll insert a uh, Surgeon General's warning here to, uh, to everybody, which is concentrated investing <clears throat> can, in fact, be extremely negative to your net worth if you don't have the right personality to carry it out. And that personality, we'll see from a couple of the stories or anecdotes that I'll give you today, is very unusual. I liken it to the guys who <clears throat> you know who are 80, 90 years old and have been smoking and drinking all their lives and are healthier than you are. So, <clears throat> you know, there is a certain subset of investors who either are genetically programmed or have sufficient discipline that they're able to think in these very long-term time horizons, and they're also able to follow their own path. And we'll see one unusual example of that uh, as I talk uh, more about some of the actual uh, investors we profile in the, uh, in the book. A uh, <clears throat> little bit on academics. Having been an academic for 12 years, we felt that it was appropriate to put a little academic information in the book. And basically, <clears throat> most of the uh, observations we make from an academic point of view are relatively obvious. If you think about them, the problem is that most people don't really think about them much. And uh, one of the observations, which I think is terribly important, particularly given on what's going on in markets these days, is <clears throat> that the more you diversify a portfolio, the uh, closer to the mean your results will be. So, uh, in fact, if you have a portfolio of 15 stocks, your chances of beating the index are one in four, whereas if you have a portfolio of 250 stocks, your chances of beating the index are less than one in 50. So <clears throat> by diversifying, which for years everybody was told was a great thing to do because it lowered risk and didn't overly affect one's return, actually it very <clears throat> closely brackets the level of outperformance that you're going to be able to get. So uh, that is uh, one important fact. The other um, more academic uh, topic that we cover in the book is something called the Kelly formula, which some of you I'm sure are familiar with. And that was uh, actually a formula <clears throat> invented uh, for uh, operation in Las Vegas. So it's a betting, betting formula, and the purpose of the formula initially was to calculate optimal size bets at the uh, poker tables and, and blackjack tables in, uh, in Las Vegas. Turns out, of course, with some modifications, you can apply it to stock picking as well. And the really interesting thing about the Kelly formula or the modified forms of the Kelly formula is that it actually <coughs> calculates your optimal investment size given certain probabilities. And that, of course, is the rub because you have to figure out what those probabilities are, which is a non-trivial problem. But assuming you were given by some gracious uh, person, the exact probabilities of the outcome of a particular investment, Kelly formula would ex exactly calculate this is the optimal betting uh, strategy or the optimal sizing strategy for that particular investment. Turns out that <clears throat> even for quite modest um, win-loss ratio, so the probability of winning is only slightly higher than the probability of losing, the Kelly formula calculates enormously concentrated bets or enormously sized bets. I mean, things that would uh, definitely surprise the, uh, the average uh, uh, investor. So it's not uncommon for Kelly formula results to tell you to put 70, 60, 70 percent of your portfolio in a, 60, in a single position. So uh, <clears throat> that was actually relatively eye-opening 
to, uh, to us as well and uh, really does point to uh, the uh, strategy of investing that is to really concentrate and to have large uh, portfolio positions. Those of you who, and I'm sure many of the people in this room have studied Buffett, yeah, <clears throat> no doubt remember his Amex investments uh, and uh, the salad oil scandal and all those good things. And uh, <clears throat> Warren actually had uh, at its peak over 30% of his portfolio invested in, in Amex. You also probably remember more recently that Ruane Kniff, a uh, firm uh, that Warren holds in very high regard, also had more than 30% of its portfolio invested in Valiant Pharmaceuticals, which uh, resulted in, uh, unfortunately, disastrous losses for them. So concentration, if uh, <clears throat> done right, can work for you uh, extremely well. If uh, you make the wrong concentrated bets, however, it can be a real problem, not only for your returns, but for your, uh, for your business. So I wanted to uh, read you two relatively brief uh, quotes. Uh, one comes from Warren Buffett in uh, 1993, and the other comes from John Maynard Keynes more than uh, 50 years earlier. So what Warren says is, the strategy we've adopted precludes our following standard differen differentiation dogma. Many pundits would therefore say that the strategy must be riskier than that employed by more conventional investors. We disagree. We believe that the policy of portfolio concentration may well decrease risk if it raises, as it should, both the intensity with which an investor thinks about a business and the comfort level he must feel with, his, with the business's economic characteristics before he buys into it. In stating <clears throat> this opinion, we define risk using the dictionary term, which is the possibility of loss or injury. Obviously not exactly the same term technology used by most people in finance. On the other hand, what uh, Keynes uh, said is, as time goes on, I get more and more convinced that the right method in investing is to put fairly large sums into enterprises which one thinks one knows something about and in the man management of which one thoroughly believes. It is a mistake to think that <coughs> one, it is a mistake, sorry, it is a mistake to think that one limits one's risk by spreading too much and between too many enterprises about which one knows little and has less reason for special confidence. One's knowledge and experience are definitely limited and there are seldom more than two or three enterprises at any given time in which I personally feel myself entitled to put my full confidence. I think the thing that's really striking here is that uh, <clears throat> John Maynard Keynes, uh, you know, basically uh, who predated and was on, obviously on the opposite side of the ocean uh, from Ben Graham, who certainly predated Warren Buffett, came up with almost the exact wording to the, to, uh, to the wording that Buffett used. So either Warren copied off of him or, uh, or Keynes got there first. Interestingly, if you study Keynes <clears throat> more fully, it is actually almost uh, unbelievable how many statements he makes that uh, uh, sort of uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, um, pre predict, for lack of a better term, since it's not coming to me, uh, <clears throat> later thoughts about value investing. The whole concept of margin of safety was uh, explicitly discussed by Keynes and uh, many of the other basic value investing concepts he also came to believe in. Interestingly, the way he came to believe in them is quite a fascinating story. He started out as a commodities trader and his original statement to his investors 
was <clears throat> that since he had superior knowledge of economic cycles based on his obvious abilities in economics, he would be able to predict prices of, uh, of commodities relatively accurately. Uh, unfortunately, those investors lost all their money, not once, but twice following uh, Keynes down this path. And uh, Keynes moved from being an entirely short-term trader to being a true devout value investor over the course of his career. So you have to give him a lot of credit. Obviously, brilliant guy, but also a brilliant guy that was smart enough to learn from his uh, prior mistakes. Thank you.